Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Derek Snyder, Senior Director for Science Partnerships at the American Psychological Association. Thank you for joining us today, and please let us know where you're from by saying hello in our chat. Today's program is the second episode of Science Showcase, an exciting new APA webinar series on hot topics in psychological science research presented firsthand by the authors who did the work. Each month, an editor from one of APA's 89 journals will invite recently published researchers to showcase their findings. We hope you'll continue to join us as we learn from experts and emerging leaders, explore terrific new models and methods, and discover psychological science that inspires. Before we get started today, I wanna to share a few quick announcements. First, many thanks to those submitted questions for today's program. We'll try to get to as many of those questions as possible. You can also ask questions during the program using the Q&A feature on your dashboard, and we'll add them to our list. Please remember to adjust your volume during presentations so that you can hear them clearly. And finally, this program is being recorded. Everyone who registered will receive an email with a link to the recording in about two weeks time. Now, I'm pleased today to introduce today's host, Joel Wong, Editor-in-Chief of Psychology of Men and Masculinities. Joel is Chair of the Department of Counseling and Educational Psychology at Indiana University Bloomington. Welcome to the program, Joel. It's a pleasure to be here. So when people think of the, of the phrase psychology of men and masculinities, that could be a loaded phrase for some people. And I wanted to ask you to give us kind of an overview of what the field includes and what, what does the field actually study and how broad is it? Yeah, be del delighted to, uh, to address that. Um, I think Derek, you're, you're very right to say that um, this is a very loaded topic and people immediately have reactions when I tell them that, um, you know, I'm the editor of a journal that's entitled Psychology of Men and Masculinity. So I'll, I'll just begin by sharing some of the reactions I've received from, from friends. Um, it was like, whoa, it's like, is this like men's magazine? <laughs> you know, um, is this, you know, and, and so what, what comes up for some folks would be images of um, macho men who are um, engaged in lifting weights and are obsessed with health um, uh, and all kinds of, of, um, of very fascinating images come up to people's minds when, when you think about men and masculinities. So I think it would just be helpful for me to just lay out how broad the, the field is. So what we need to think about this, this field of, of study is, is, is to look at how we categorize this view into both the study of boys and men, as well as the study of masculinities. And so in, in regard to the study of the lives of boys and men, it's anything and everything that relates to their lives. Um, of course, there would be certain topics that would be of particular interest, but uh, there's always a lot of interest uh, in, in uh, boys and men's health, mental health. So these, these two issues have been um, very uh, dominant areas of research uh, in our view, the study of, of boys and men's health and mental health. Uh, but it also covers a wide variety of things like the career interests, men and boys in, in workplaces, um, relationships, both in terms of romantic relationships, as well as friendships and familiar relationships. Um, it, th those are just kind of issues that, that come under the broad rubric of boys and men. Now, the, the, the aspect that is a little bit more interesting and, and not as easy to understand initially is masculinities. Like, what the heck is that? So if I just throw out the word masculinity, you know, people immediately think, it's about um, how macho you are or how big and strong you are. And maybe, maybe there is. But here's, here's a really easy way to understand masculinities. You can think of masculinities as simply as the meanings that people attribute uh, to 
boys and to men, to women too, even to objects and to concept, con uh, concepts. Um, doesn't even have to be an object. It could be an idea. But it's meanings that you attribute to these things or people that are in some way associated with men, all right? So, so what do I mean by that? Let me give some very concrete examples. One very easy example would be stereotypes would be an example of masculinities. Stereotypes that we have about men, right, uh, and boys, those fall under the study of masculinities. But what's interesting is that masculine stereotypes can also be applied to, to women. Some women uh, in certain demographic groups are stereotyped as masculine. And so the study of masculinities extend beyond the study of boys and men because it could even apply uh, to women or to individuals um, who, who don't subscribe to the uh, male and female uh, binary. So that's, that's one example, stereotypes. Um, Masculinities can also exist in a form of norms, right? So norms would be um, ideas about what boys and men um, are like uh, and what boys and men should or should not do that are uh, projected by society or by an organization or by a community. So all of those could be norms. Uh, so, for example, you might say in the U.S., there might be certain norms about what men are and what men should or should not do. Uh, I'll just share one or two examples. Uh, one of the most consistent and widely identified norms is that about men is that men should not be feminine. So if you do anything or you behave in a particular way, if you're a man and you behave in a particular way that is perceived to be feminine, then you are violating a masculine norm, right? Uh, but I want to give a third, uh, a third example of masculinity. And this is, this is where it gets even more interesting, right? You know, I talked about stereotypes. And stereotypes are typically uh, meanings that you attribute to human beings, right? But if you go a step farther, these meanings can even be attributed to non-humans. And so the study of masculinities goes beyond human beings. Let me give some very practical examples. Have you ever wondered why um, women are far more likely to be vegans and vegetarians than men? Uh, this is, this is uh, indisputable. You can just search it out. You know, statistics that, that clearly demonstrate it. Women are more likely to be vegan and vegetarians. Well, I have a hypothesis for why that's the case. And that's indirectly backed up by research because meat is infused with meanings of masculinity. So meat of all different types of food that you eat is perceived to be more masculine than vegetables, all right? Uh, and we got research backing that up that's published in our journal. Uh, and so if you are a man, and you know, you're kind of widely aware that meat is associated with masculinities and it's more masculine, that you are less likely to want to give up eating meat because it feels like you're, you're losing some aspect of your gender identity, right? Uh, it's also very fascinating to think about why uh, men are often not very invested in cooking, but we want exception at the barbecue pits you're more likely to see men who would be um, there trying to cook some meat uh, because why, again, their meanings of masculinity is they're associated with that act. Um, so so I, I, hope it, I hope this gives you, gives, gives the audience also uh, a sampling of the types of research that we do that is so broad and so interesting. And I'll just end this brief introduction by saying, when you think about it for a moment, you realize that masculinities are ubiquitous, which is another way of saying that masculinities are everywhere. It's, 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 uh, it exists in the stereotypes you have, it exists in the perceptions you have of people, it exists in the norms that are all over the place, it exists on billboards, on, in the media, uh, in the food we eat, in the academic subjects that we, we study. 
in the professions that we seek, that research showing that certain professions are seen as more masculine and certain professions are seen as less masculine. And so once you, once you come to that conclusion, it makes life so much more interesting. Masculinities are everywhere. All right, I'll stop here for a minute. That's really interesting. I, I really love how you frame this as the field interested in studying how men and boys behave and in how certain behaviors come to be seen as masculine, but then also in understanding who actually engages in those behavior. And we understand that it's not always men that engage in these supposedly masculine behaviors. And in fact, these behaviors can extend even to species that aren't even human. So I wanna ask what, what made you excited about the two speakers that we're going to be hearing from today? Sure. Well, is this a good time to talk about, introduce them or just talk more sure. about the research? Um, well, we have uh, uh, two speakers today, uh, Dr. Angelica Ferreira, um, who is from Stanford University, and we have Dr. Nick uh, Bergoglia, who is from Texas Tech University. Uh, and so both of them have published, recently published, articles in um, our journal, the journal for which I, I am the editor, The Psychology of Men and Masculinities. Um, and uh, the, the work that they publish is just so interesting and fascinating and uh, has, has great contemporary um, relevance, right? So for uh, Dr. Ferreira, um, I'm not going to steal the thunder, so I'm just going to give kind of uh, a, a brief introduction. Um, I think it's just a fascinating um, uh, topic that she's tackled about why uh, men are less likely to be involved in um, the helping professions. So when I say the helping professions, you know, I'm thinking about uh, professions like teaching and nursing and, and counseling, of which that's my, my background, right? Um, and it's fascinating because there's been a lot of attention, um, and I think rightly so, on how we can have women be more involved uh, in and how we can support women in professions that are male-dominated, which tends to be the STEM fields, right? Uh, STEM standing for uh, science and technology, engineering and math. Uh, women are under, underrepresented in many of these STEM fields. Um, there's systemic reasons, including sexism, uh, stereotypes, and, and other, other barriers that women have. Uh, and there's a lot of research, a lot of thinking about like how do we get, how we how do we make it easier for women to be in in STEM professions? How can we lower the barriers? How can we make the environment more conducive? Um, but the reverse is also an interesting question, right? Which we need to also ask questions about why are there so few men in these um, helping professions that I've just talked about, uh, teaching, like counseling, uh, nursing, and what does it what does it reveal about what's going on? Why why is this happening? What's happening? Um, and how can we change that? And why is it important to change that? I, I think there are really good reasons why we need to see men uh, be represented more in these professions. I'm not going to uh, articulate them now. I, I, I think Angelica would be to uh, do that later. Uh, but that's, that's really fascinating. Um, now, the, uh, as for the other article, and that's by uh, Dr. Begonia, um, you know, I think Nick's research is just interesting. He has um, conducted a research study looking at masculinities and firearms. Isn't that, I'm not gonna reveal uh, the findings of the study for now because I wanna let Nick talk about it, but that's a hot topic today. I mean, we've got um, uh, a problem here in the United States with uh, too many deaths and murders by firearms. And the, the very uncomfortable fact we have to wrestle with is that the vast majority of these firearm murders are conducted by men. I wanna make it very clear to the audience here, all right? Most men are not violent and murderers, uh, murderers and most men do not go around uh, misusing firearms. 
It's a very tiny percentage of men who do that. But the reality is that most of these individuals who use their firearms to kill people are men, right? So people know that. So it's like, okay, yeah. But remember what I said earlier about the difference between men and masculinities, right? So it's not just the fact that men are, are, are represented at higher rates. If that's all that we found in the research, you already knew that. But masculinities is in some way implicated in the interest and ownership of firearms, all right? And I'm not going to let the cat, the cat out of the bag, but uh, Nick is going to tackle this question and has tackled this question in a very fascinating ways. It's a particular type of masculinities that may be driving an interest in firearms. So I'll stop you for a minute, but I was like, these are very interesting uh, work that's published in our journal. That's great. Well, without further ado, why don't you go ahead and introduce our first speaker? All right. So we've got um, Dr. Angelica um, Ferreira here. And whoops, I'm just noticing, um, Derek, that I am not seeing Dr. Ferreira's bio here. Okay, I can, I can step in. Um, okay, I apologize. I, I'm looking at the... Totally okay. So Angelica Puzio Ferrara is a developmental and social psychologist at the Clayman Institute for Gender Research at Stanford University. Her writing and research seek to understand how gender ideologies manifest in human behavior throughout the lifespan and across cultures. Together with scholars at the Toward Gender Harmony Project, she has explored the culturally situated nature of gender stereotypes in 62 nations through collaborations in social psychological and personality science, the Journal of Cultural Psychology, and the European Journal of Social Psychology. At Stanford, she's working on a book that examines boys and men's friendships across history and culture. Ferreira comes to the Clayman Institute after completing her PhD at New York University, where she was part of the Global Fellowship Program at NYU's London Center. Ferreira's writing on the intersection of gender and culture has been published in the Washington Post, Teen Vogue, and 538, and her work has been featured by The Economist and by us at APA. Without further ado, Dr. Ferreira. Hi everyone, my name is Angelica Ferrara and I'm honored to be here with you today presenting my co-authored paper with Tim Baustein titled Gender Segregation and Culturally Feminized Work, Theory and Evidence of Boys' Capacity for Care, recently out in Psychology of Men and Masculinities. So I want to tell you a tiny bit about me before I jump into this new paper. I'm a developmental and social psychologist coming from NYU where I recently got my PhD and I'm now a postdoctoral scholar at Stanford University within the Clayman Institute for Gender Research. So I generally study these three questions. I'm not going to go into all three of them within a lot of depth, but generally I study the ways that gender norms, which we can think of as megastructures of social thought, come to be embodied in behavior. So as a developmental psychologist, I think a lot about children's microsystems and macrosystems. So in this first question of my work, I look at the relationship between those macro level ideologies about gender, race, class, and I look at how they are embodied in or manifested within behavior, such as the quality of our social relationships, uh, our mental health, our language use, and in this paper, our career choices. So these questions coalesce into the current paper on the gendered economy of work. So in this paper, I am looking at the number of men working in culturally feminized sectors and why this number remains so low. So it's a really puzzling and sobering phenomenon, but we wanted to understand from multiple vantage points and across literatures, how these numbers are remaining so incredibly uh, stratified. So you might be used to the acronym STEM for science and technology, engineering and math, and the efforts to increase women and girls representation within those fields, but you might be less familiar with this term HEED. I think it might be covered up by my video bubble there, but what HEED means is jobs that are historically occupied by women and rely on a core set of skills that are culturally feminized. So these are things 
uh, like caring for members of society that are vulnerable, like children, uh, the sick, elderly, etc. And it stands for healthcare, early childhood education, and domestic roles. So when I use heed in this presentation, that is what I'm referring to. So we felt it was important to understand the conditions that give rise to gender segregation and heed roles for a couple of reasons. The first, and I'm going to move through these a little bit quickly, but the first is that men's participation in these roles doesn't appear to be changing. So you can see from our figure here using data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics that the percentage of women in STEM is gradually increasing from 2003, 2020, but men in heed careers has hovered close to 20% throughout this same period. And if we turn the clock back even further, looking all the way back to 1980, these numbers look either relatively similar and sometimes worse for men's participation. So we're seeing this steady rise in STEM, but we're not seeing a commensurate rise in the data on men's participation in heed. But to make this maybe a little bit more intuitive, here's some of the actual percentages of men's uh, participation in these careers. So nursing is at about 10% men, occupational therapists about 12%, dental assistants 5% men, and then elementary and early childhood education, uh, this is at 1.3% men. So it varies somewhat, but these numbers are still incredibly low and incredibly stark. This is also an incredibly understudied disparity. So when we look at data from the Web of Science, we show that the rate of publications dedicated towards understanding women's absence in STEM uh, is, it dwarfs the number of publications dedicated to understanding men's absence in HEED. So we feel that there's real room for growth here and a lot of questions that remain unanswered. And this line here with women in STEM being so starkly different and this rate of increase being so much higher shows that we have a lot of work to do. And finally, we think this is important to study because there are a lot of problems that exist even when men do make it into these fields. So using this uh, graph here, also data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, we show that men tend to out-earn women when they are in the same jobs when men do indeed enter HEED careers. So men in HEED are making more than women in HEED. And the same is true uh, for STEM, but with women making less than men. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the method for this paper, and I can talk more about that in the Q&A, but essentially what we did is a grounded theory analysis of the literature across psychology, sociology, education, gender studies, and organizational behavior to understand the underlying conditions for uh, gender disparity within uh, the labor market. So we identified 722 relevant works that met our criteria and analyzed them for underlying conditions. This is not going to the next slide. So the first condition that we identified across this work is the way that care is, like most things, categorized in a patriarchal gender system as being inherent to women. So when we live in a society where all human traits and skills are assigned a gender and a status and often a race and a class, men and boys are perceptive of these realities and often act in accordance with them. So a boy who is guided by signals in his environment related to gender might come to the conclusion that such jobs like he jobs are not aspirational and they are low status or feminized, um, often uh, in boys' words said as girly. So a key part of where boys are learning this idea that certain traits are girly or undesirable is in the socialization of social and emotional skill sets. And so by this, I mean capacities that are central for heat careers like perspective taking, nurturance, listening skills, caretaking tasks. So what the developmental, developmental literature tells us is that boys begin childhood uh, very interested in and ready to learn these skills, but they learn to conceal them over time 
as they receive social sanctions for exercising them. Whereas girls, on the other hand, refine and strengthen these skills over time and are praised for showing them as skills that are congruent with their gender role. So many boys gradually learn uh, that showing interest in being a teacher when they grow up, for example, um, is to cross an ideological barrier that can be viewed as less than in comparison to developing a career interest that is in line with the masculine norms that uh, many boys, boys are surrounded by. So by looking across these literatures, we also find that men face barriers to entry when they are interested in these fields or trying to work within them. So these can be things like harassment, I see climate, rejection from those who are expecting a woman caretaker in some of these roles, and other forms of feeling unwanted in their workplaces. So men also face what Williams calls a glass escalator. So this means that men tend to get promoted earlier when they get into heed fields and often into more high paying, more masculinized jobs quicker than women. So for example, uh, a man who's a nurse who's promoted very quickly into healthcare administration, a higher paying, more masculinized version uh, or place where those skills are, are going to be used in a more masculinized way. And these men who benefit from the glass escalator phenomenon are more likely to be white. And finally, we find that heed research, like the paper I'm talking about right now, is poorly incentivized in the academic system. So in the paper, we track some of the actual money here, but we show that many um, million dollar grants uh, are going towards women in STEM, which we think is fantastic that that work is incentivized, but we're not seeing a commensurate effort, nothing of a congruent nature happening for feminized jobs. So we think that a fundamental contributor of making change in terms of these disparities is being able to catalyze the engines of innovation like grant funding, grant funding and uh, publication to actively study these things and understand uh, the various places where we can make inroads to improvement. So this might sound pretty bleak. There are a lot of overlapping and interrelated factors that contribute to uh, men's absence in heed careers. So what do we do about this? In the paper, I outline a lot more uh, recommendations with specificity and depth, but here, just to talk about three very quickly, targeting boys' socialization agents, parents, peers, teachers, children's literature and media, people who are at the center of those fields, to show more men in heed careers as being normal rather than exceptional, and providing boys with healthy examples of masculinity that show an expansive range of traits um, and skills as, as normal um, and uh, part of boys' normal emotional worlds. And then also restoring and not reforming men's capacity for care. So we know from this literature that men have the capacity for care and it's that this capacity is concealed, not that it isn't there. So coming at intervention from this angle rather than this angle of fixing men or creating traits that never existed. And finally, we think that our universities and companies and grant funding agencies need to be made aware of work like this that makes their lopsidedness, lopsidedness and their priorities more clear so we can begin to push forward um, towards funding opportunities that address all sides of gender segregation in the workplace, not just those that relate to women and STEM. So through all these recommendations, we hope that we can create the conditions where more men and boys feel unafraid to express their nurturing and emotionally astute capacities and feel that these things are worthy of exploring in a career. Thank you for your time. And these are some people who are fundamental in creating this paper and bringing it to life. Thank you for listening. Hi, everyone. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ferreira, for, for this really interesting and enlightening um, presentation. You know, we're going to uh, definitely uh, come back to you with uh, more questions for now. Um, but for now, we're going to uh, um, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Bergoglia, and uh, Dr. Nicholas Bergoglia is an assistant professor in the AP accredited. Counseling Psychology PhD program 
program with, within the departments of psychological science at Texas Tech University. He graduated in 2021 with his PhD in combined integrated clinical and counseling psychology. He specializes in understanding contextual variables related to mental illness and social problems. Nick has been a recipient of the American Psychological Association of Division 51, which is the Society for the Psychological Study of Men and Masculinities, um, Innovative Research Scholarship, and the APA Division 17, that's Counseling Psychology, um, Counseling Center Outstanding Graduate Intern Award. Nick, so happy to have you on board. Hey everyone, my name is Dr. Nick Bergonia, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the precarious masculinity of firearm ownership. So let's dive right in. Um, so gun violence is a considerable social problem uh, that we face today, um, even in the time from, you know, getting the invitation to come talk about this and putting this uh, video recording together. Uh, we've had several more mass shootings, uh, which is unfortunate. <laughs> One of the things we observe about uh, these shootings are is that they are uh, almost universally committed by men. Now, of course, there's a, a couple of exceptions to that, but it's it's heavily it's a heavily gendered uh, phenomenon. Now, most of the victims also tend to be men, uh, and so that begs the question: you know, what what's this masculinity and and gun violence or uh, firearm ownership? Uh, what, what's this connection all about? Well, some of our previous research has, has shown that conformity to various masculine uh, male role norms are um, are associated, positively associated with firearm ownership, uh, stuff like wanting to be dominant, wanting to take risks, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, there are several other uh, good conceptual pieces out there. I don't uh, have time to go through all of them, uh, but there's a lot of uh, conceptual talk about, you know, uh, owning a firearm and using a firearm as a, as a display of one's masculinity. Uh, in particular, uh, we have uh, what's called the precarious masculinity uh, or precarious masculine paradigm uh, by uh, Vandello and Bosan. And um, this, this paradigm is used to explain sort of dysfunctional um, masculine behavior in general. Um, and we sought to apply it to uh, firearm ownership um, as a prerequisite to gun violence. So, uh, the precarious masculine paradigm suggests that manhood is an elusive achieved status, um, one that must be earned uh, in contrast to womanhood, which is ascribed or assigned uh, more based on uh, biology. So what, what that means is you kind of have to show that you're a man. And a good example of this is uh, those commercials where um, you, there, there's several different commercials, but one that comes to mind is the one where the guy accidentally uses his like girlfriend's soap in the shower. And once once he finds out that he's used a woman's soap, he's got to go like smash a beer against his head um, in order to show that he's really a man. Um, what's what's that what that's demonstrating is that uh, and it's achieved status, one that's got to be earned. Um, another thing about it is that it can be lost. So if you do something that's feminine or not traditionally masculine, uh, you lose your masculinity. Um, by extension, you then have to do something uh, masculine in order to try and get that back. It, re it requires uh, confirmation by others. And so if you were to kind of take these ideas and extend them to firearm ownership, one of the things you, that might explain why firearm ownership and, and gun violence by extension of that uh, is so associated with males is that these men are trying to prove that they're really men because they're insecure about their masculinity. So um, that's an assertion here. That's uh, kind of our theory that we're using. Um, and we sought to test that. So how did we test it? What we did is we uh, um, we, we tested this multiple ways, actually, and have multiple sets of data. Um, I'm just going to be talking about uh, some of the data that we uh, published in the paper, uh, the citation that was at the beginning. I'd be happy to share it if anybody's interested. Um, but essentially what we did is we uh, pretended to be marketing researchers looking at um, what types of personality traits pr uh, predict product interest. And so this, this was an IRB approved study that used deception, essentially. We, we were trying to mislead participants about the nature of our study. Um, we assigned several 
personality measures. They weren't really kind of traditional personality measures. They were just surveys, uh, like the conformity to masculine role norms inventory. We used that. We didn't actually present the data, um, but we were kind of using that as a as a personality inventory, something that looks personality-ish. So we assigned this to a bunch of participants and we present them with artificial uh, personality profiles. So everybody got back the same profile. It's like your openness to experience scores here. And it's, we gave a little interpretation like, oh, you're in the normal range. Um, extroversion, you're here, you're in the normal range. It was all complete, uh, you know, complete BS. Uh, everybody got the same score. Uh, same profile, with exception uh, to to two indicators. Um, so for the men, uh, we as randomly assigned folks to get a uh, a low masculinity profile. So the, all the profiles the same as everybody else, except uh, a few of these men got their masculinity score, and it was really really low. Um, the other, uh, of course, is with women. Uh, where they got a femininity score, and that was that was really low. And then we have uh, control participants who uh, their masculinity was normal, or for the women, their femininity was normal. Now, if you read the paper, we also had uh, boost conditions. Where they had high masculinity, high femininity. I'm not for the sake of time. I'm not going to dive into that, um, but it is in the paper. The findings weren't terribly interesting from my perspective. Uh, but what was more interesting are these threat conditions. That's what's testing our um, our theory here. So um, then we randomly assigned them to a firearm category. Remember, we were interested in uh, uh, product purchase. Um, and so uh, the firearm category was the product these participants were assigned to. In, in all reality, everybody just got the, the firearm category. Um, but we, we kind of were trying to deceive them into thinking others may have gotten another category. So anyways, um, we assigned them to the firearm category and presented them with various uh, different guns. And then we asked them uh, on a scale of one to five, um, five being more, how much they would want or need um, this this product and how useful it was. Uh, for the for the purposes of this presentation, I'm just going to talk about the, the want indicator, although it, pretty much everything lined up in the paper, we actually used a, a total score indicator. And um, you know, you can check the paper out to learn more about that. But basically what we have here is uh, we start with this one, this little pistol here, and we ask them, well, how much do you want this? Um, remember, it's a scale of one to five, so three would be just middle of the road. So men in the control condition, uh, right, right around a three. Um, so nothing nothing exciting there. Women in the control, right around three, nothing nothing to report there. Men in the low M, so that's the threat condition. So we've, we've said you have low masculinity, even though it's complete BS. Remember, we just said, we didn't, the tests are all nonsense, but we tell them you have low masculinity. What do we see here? A jump and how much they want this this firearm or this product. And so in order to be consistent with the theory, though, let's see what happens when we threaten women's femininity. Sure enough, nothing. Uh, not non significantly different from women or men in the control groups. And the effect size of that difference, well, the difference between men in the control and men in the threat conditions is a D of 0.35. So that's that's small, it's small to moderate. Um, but big enough, uh, big enough that you wouldn't want to ignore it. So it's we we have something here. So let's go on. So what if we show them this this uh, you know this machine gun we got here? Um, how much do you think they'd want that? Well, men in the control, right around a three. No difference. No difference there. Women in the control, no difference there. What about men in the threat condition? Well, we have a replication going now. Sure enough, we have another jump. Um, uh, a good, good little jump there again um, with interest in this this firearm, and uh, consistent with the previous one, no uh, no difference for women whose femininity has been threatened. Uh, the effect size again, uh, kind of small to moderate, um, D of 0.31, uh, big enough that you probably wouldn't want to ignore. So let's try it one more time. Uh, let's see this gun, uh, this kind of huntingish rifle. Um, not sure what the actual formal. Uh, gun is off the top of my head, but we see this similar results here. How much do you want this gun? Men in the control, kind of below a three, right around a three. Women in the control, right around a three. Sure enough, we see the effect once more um, with men in the threat condition. And uh, women in the low low uh, femininity group, sure enough, same effect, uh, non-significant from the others. With men in the control versus men in the threat condition, another D of point 
three, six. So roughly the same effect size across all three. Um, if you should do this with similar indicators, so if you word it like how much do you need or how useful would this um, would this product be for you? Same same effect. About a D of point, uh, you know, a little over point three between men in the threat condition and men in the control. No difference between any of the other groups. So so what does this mean? Um, well, our, our it, it confirmed our theory is that uh, interest in firearms followed a precarious masculinity paradigm. If you threaten a, a man's masculinity, regardless of whatever objective indicator you might use, if you just threaten it, if they perceive the masculinity has been threatened, uh, you see increases in wants, needs, per, and perceived use of a, of a firearm compared to other groups. Uh, this means that uh, insecure masculinity or precarious masculinity is connected to firearm ownership. You might even, oh, I disappeared there. Hopefully you can still hear me. Um, that means that uh, if you were to take that a step further, uh, firearm ownership might be one of the, the reasons behind gun violence, um, at, at least in part. There's probably other factors here uh, that we need to consider, but you, you wouldn't want to rule this out. The threatened masculinity is an expression that might be expressed through, through gun violence. Um, that's something that we're going to be exploring uh, a little bit further. So if you were to have an intervention about this, uh, if you wanted to change um, gun violence or at least firearm, you know, the firearm ownership, social initiatives should take aim to diffuse the masculinity gun connection. So for instance, why does owning a gun make you a man? Like that's sort of an arbitrary, um, that's sort of an arbitrary belief in, in reality. And um, one way of reducing gun violence would be to reduce firearm ownership. So with men, we see disproportionate amounts of not only gun violence, but just firearm ownership in general, we might aim to try and uh, diffuse that relationship. So you don't need to be, you don't need to own a gun to be a man, that sort of thing. So it's something to consider. It's something we're working on more. And, uh, you know, me, my mentor, Ryan McDermott, who's a, a co-author on this paper, um, we do some of this work and uh, we hope that it'll, in the end, help us uh, reduce uh, gun violence and list death um, associated with guns. So thank you all for uh, listening today. I'd be happy to uh, share more if anybody had any questions later. Take care. Hey, everyone. My name All right. Um, thank you very much, Nick. Um, so, so just this is now a time for a Q&A um, for both of um, our guests here, uh, and I'll be moderating the questions. Um, so for those of, you who are, those of you who are in the audience, you know, I want you to feel free to be able to post questions in the chat. I do want to uh, say in advance that we probably will not be able to get to all of your questions. Uh, you know, I apologize in advance because we will have to end. We have about just about 12, 13 minutes for questions. Uh, and then we also have some pre-submitted questions that uh, that came up. Um, so, Dr. Bagoya, I'm going to start with you since you just um, concluded your presentation, and I will flip back and forth with, between you and Dr. Ferreira. So, um, just a first question for for you, um, since you know you talked about how it is so important to diffuse that connection between masculinities and guns, right? Um, where you, you want to be able to disassociate the two. Can, can you talk a little bit about some practical ways that um, we can do that, um, both in society as large, as parents, um, and institutions? Yeah, so, so that's the real question, right? Like, so how do you go about dismantling this relationship? So we have a few ideas. Um, I would say they're just ideas at this point. Um, but awareness is always the first step. So talking about it, um, talking about it in families, with friends, um, in uh, educational settings, um, those that's that's a good sort of first step. Um, I think um, if you were to think about like public awareness campaigns, uh, that might be another uh, a bigger step. I can think of. Um, I don't know that anybody's done it with with firearms, but I'm thinking of like, uh, I don't know. I remember a few years ago, like Gillette did like that commercial series that tried to change, you know, kind of how men are perceived and how men act. If you were to sort of 
take something like that uh, on a mass scale and apply it to firearms, you you might see some effect there. Um, you might also get a little bit of pushback from you know so the the, the gun proud people. Um, but I think the more we talk about it and the more we share findings like this, that even if it's just through osmosis, that you'll it'll start permeating a little bit more. So I think uh, more discussion is probably the, the, the easiest first step. Um, we also talk about things, you know, like counseling, you know, men who have high amounts of uh, like in, insecurities with their masculinity. Uh, that might be a more direct route, especially for those who might be prone to violence. So men who are incarcerated or in the criminal justice system um, who who will maybe be mandated to have counseling. This might be a top of, of discussion for uh, psychologists and counselors working with them. Uh, so that's another avenue that you might consider. Um, there's several others, but I think, uh, you know, for the purposes of your question, hopefully that gives you some ideas to start with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, Dr. Ferreira, um, a question that came in for you um, was, what can parents and teachers do to promote uh, HEAT uh, careers in, in boys? And, and, and I picked this question as of a personal interest. Uh, you know, I have a son who's a teenager, and I, I want him to be open to, to HEAT uh, professions. Definitely. I love this question, and I think there's so much that parents and teachers and all of those people who are in boys microsystems can do to really normalize these careers and not just normalize them, but to view them as aspirational and not something that's a sort of a step down in career, but to really see it as something that's so, so integral to our society's functioning. So it really depends on the age of the boys that we're talking about, but this could stretch from things like the, the nature of images that boys see in children's books, in TV shows, just to normalizing uh, a man as a nurse, a man as a teacher, a man who's caring for an elderly parent. These ways of expanding that range of what's normal, I think is really, really key and encouraging boys um, to view these things as a really positive um, choice. And so boys are very perceptive of all the ways that we downgrade any sort of caring profession, even just the amount of excitement we have about talking about, for example, um, going to an engineering major versus uh, working on classes that might facilitate a career in preschool education. So as parents being aware and teachers as well, being aware of all of those ways that we show our sort of implicit excitement or perhaps lack of interest in our boys going towards these careers is really, really important. And boys are so exquisitely attuned to all of those signals in their environment. So the more that parents and teachers can really position these things as aspirational, as really, really important, I think is going to go a long way. Oh, oh thank you. Thank you, Angelica. Um, there's a question that just came in, which I thought, you know, I might, might as well just have you answer it as a follow-up um, by, by Digo, who says, well, should men in heat professions be praised to promote them as role models, or could that backfire by making them special while it should just be normal for men to choose uh, a profession. I, I'm just thinking of the fact that, you know, I, I, I'm recognizing my own male privilege. If I if I tell people that I do a little bit of cooking, you know, it seems that's very impressive. But if my wife does cooking, that's that's normal. You know? so right. This is I think something that we we see really commonly and campaigns that have tried to increase men's participation in these fields have gone at it from these various angles. And there is a backfiring when we take this angle that appeals to a masculinized angle. Because remember when we sort of put this on a pedestal for men, what we're doing then is also appealing to this, uh, this angle of being sort of a moral crusader as coming in and saving things, making things better, and also sort of reifies this position of, of dominance and, and one's over importance within the field. So uh, sort of appealing to men from these angles has been shown to be ineffective at recruitment, but instead, I think uh, the UK's Men in the Early Years is a great example of a campaign that does this really well, encourages men uh, to come into these careers, uh, basically saying, 
men have these interests, men have these capacities, men are needed and women are needed. Care is everyone's responsibility. So not sort of positioning things as unequal, but rather a form of gender partnership where everyone has equal responsibility in um, caring for the vulnerable and using these skill sets. But I agree, it, it definitely can backfire and that should be avoided. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, back to you, Dr. Bagoia. <laughs> Um, uh, um, I, I wanted you to address the theme of uh, race and diversity for, you know, for, for both of you. And one of the questions that came in uh, earlier was, you know, is the impact of masculinities, masculinities on firearm ownership uh, among uh, BIPOC men? And those is, um, BIPOC stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color, different from white men. Um, I, I don't know if there's any research out there. I don't think so. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Nick. But uh, you could speculate and, and you know share your thoughts on that and see what your views are. Yeah, so uh, this is an area um, in need of more research. So our, our study and like the set of studies we've done have primarily focused on precarious masculinity, so threatening the masculinity. Um, we have not, um, obviously the samples we've had uh, have been, uh, we've tried to get them to be as diverse as possible. I think, uh, we could have some improvement there. Um, I think one of the extensions of our current line of research would be purposefully designing a study that looked at, uh, the effect, uh, in white folks versus those who might identify, um, with a different racial or ethnic group. Um, so so that's an area of, in need of more research. I, I believe the question was just kind of masculinity in general. I don't know of any studies off the top of my head that look at masculinity um, as a predictor of uh, firearm, firearm ownership or gun violence or anything like that uh, across different uh, races. I do know, um, I, I, I was looking at a Pew study that talked about firearm ownership being uh, slightly more prevalent in, in white households. So either owning a gun or having access to a firearm, um, it's uh, I, I believe around 49% of, of white households, either somebody owns or will have easy access to a firearm uh, versus it's around 30, 30 some odd percent in, in black households. And then uh, uh, I believe a little bit lower in, in uh, Hispanic households, and I don't know that they collected data on other other groups. Um, so, uh, what does that mean? It means, well, that's something we need to look at further. Um, is there a? Does that mean there's a masculine connection to that? I don't know. Maybe. Um, theoretically, you could take it a couple different ways, um, but I think ultimately it's something we re we just need more research on before we say definitively what the answer might be. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Nick. Yeah. Um, Dr. Ferrer, back um, back to you. So on the issue of uh, race, you know, I, I'm wondering if you you are aware of any data that suggests that heat and STEM professions uh, um, where do they differ across racial groups and and can speculate on why that might be the case. Definitely. So there, there is quite a bit on this and this field needs to grow, but there is some research showing that, especially in fields like nursing, there are more men of color in these fields um, and that the barriers that men um, and boys are going to have to cross to either become interested in or to actively pursue one of these careers can be different and be very culturally and contextually specific. So for example, sometimes uh, researchers say that the reason why there are more men of color in nursing, for example, is because these men are not as much at the center of the power structure. So they uh, feel more comfortable sort of defying these norms because the, the status differential that they might uh, receive for doing so can be less. But this is not always the case, right? Sometimes you see research that shows that uh, men of color sort of have um, a, a larger range to compensate because they are not so central to the center of the power structure. So it really can go um, in different ways. And we see this with the, the glass escalator phenomenon where white men are more likely to be promoted into roles that are more masculinized, more more high paying, more high status than men of color who are already more prevalent within, for example, nursing. So race and ethnicity have a really big part um, in this discussion and needs to be really at the center 
rather than the margin as we continue to understand who is attracted to these fields, what are the barriers that men and boys face, and how can we sort of titrate that or make it more specific to men's cultural and contextual um, uh, context. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. Um, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, I don't know if any of the other hosts want to pose a question or comments. Sure. Um, so if a man feels that his masculinity is threatened and he goes out and buys a gun, does that fix the problem? Like, does that, does that make them feel better about their, their manhood? Or so, does that yeah. make a cascade of new <laughs> behaviors? <laughs> yeah, that, that's an interesting question, you know? Um, at least in our studies, we didn't ask anything like that. And I, I quite honestly, I didn't think to ask that. <laughs> so um, I, I, I would fall back on, uh, I, I'd be curious if Fandello and Balsan, they they maybe have checked that. I, I don't know if they have. Joel, if you know if, if they've done that, please chime in. Um, my, my gut is to say it, it might a little, but not all the way. Like there's like some, because doing something tends to be associated with a change in psychological state. So you've done something now to make up for it, but that doesn't take away the fact that the masculinity was threatened in the first place. You still have that memory. You still have that feeling. So if I were to guess, if I were to hypothesize and, and design another study to look at this, my guess is you would see, so you say you have like masculine, like security and masculinity is here, it gets threatened, it drops, you do something, in this case, you buy a firearm, it would maybe go up a little, but not to the initial state. Now, I'm sure there's things like, you know, length of time becomes a factor with stuff like that. Um, obviously, you'll probably regress to a normal baseline with enough time. Uh, but it's an interesting question, you know. Um, so if you do something to uh, kind of demonstrate your masculinity, how, like what's how much time does that take? How much effort is involved to, to try and make up for that? Are there moderators that, that influence that? Um, there's a whole bunch of questions there that I think uh, we need to do some more research on. And I'll have a question for Angelica as well. Um, how do we normalize caring more in our society so that careers like caring professions aren't seen with a particular gendered light? This is a really, it's a great question. It's also a really big question because care is everywhere. I think that's one thing I learned from doing this paper. Care is such a normal part of our existence, but we don't often see that because often women are the people who are most at the forefront, who are seeing all the ways that care uh, is involved in everyday life from caring for children to caring for the self, to caring for those in a, uh, in a work context. So it's an incredibly broad question, but I think, um, you know, sometimes we want to change our way of representing care before the world actually catches up. So simply, let's say having television, having media uh, that that shows how things are at the moment may actually exacerbate existing gender inequalities rather than change them. So I think a big part of those ways is how we represent um, advertising in terms of uh, who's depicted in caring positions, how it's depicted in books, how it's depicted in movies. These things are where a lot of us get our our sort of social cues on normalcy. Our brains are constantly looking for examples of what can be expected in a given environment. So making these things as just everyday features of the environment as they are for so many women, but showing men, more men in those roles, I think can really um, change what people see as part of the everyday. Thank you so much to all of our speakers for sharing their insight. And thank you to our audience for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed hearing from our speakers about their work. We'll be sending you a one minute survey after this broadcast. We really wanna know how we're doing and we want you to feel free to share topics that you'd like us to cover in the future. So please answer our survey and feel free to email us at science at apa.org with your recommendations. If you like what you saw today, you should join us next month for Science Showcase, which features research from the Journal of Comparative Psychology. The link to that will be in our chat shortly and will be in our follow-up email to you. 
For other content from our journals, we encourage you to subscribe to Editor's Choice, a newsletter that we created so that psychology research chosen by editors like Joel comes hot off the presses to your inbox. Finally, please subscribe to Science Spotlight, your source for the most relevant news and information for psychological scientists by psychological scientists. Special thanks to Joel and to our wonderful speakers. We deeply appreciate your time and support. A huge shout out to our production team, Allison Spanaus, Angela Schubach, and Chandel Hoover. And most of all, thanks to you, our viewers. We're here for you and we hope to see you at our coming events. I'm Derek Snyder with Science Showcase, and I wish you good day.